Welcome to the inside of the one and only T28 Super Heavy Tank. We're here at the National Armor and Cavalry Collection, like I said, and this is Rob Cogan. He's the curator of the epic herd of tanks out here and a keeper of the history. And he is charged with not only the preservation of these tanks, but also their conservation. We'll talk a little bit about that today, particularly with regards to this tank. Yeah, so I'm really excited about this. Uh, this is the first time we've really uh, featured the interior of the T-28. Of course, everyone's seen the outside T-28, you can't miss it. Uh, but really excited to kind of do this feature video and really talk about the inside of it. Because not many people know what the interior looks like. Uh, you'll notice first off, it's white. It's really bright and white in here. Uh, it may even, to some people, look like a spray can of white paint just exploded in here because everything is just white. 90% uh, of that is correct, actually, in here. Uh, white has been used as an interior color in tanks because, as you can see, we barely have any light on in here. We have one little light here in the corner just to prevent shadow. Everything else you see in here is just natural light coming in from the driver's hatch. Uh, and the white reflects, I mean, even if you have just a little bit of even moonlight, the interior is uh, fairly visible to the crew. So that's one reason for all the white. Uh, there's a few components in here. Some of the signal, uh, the radio equipment would be in signal core green. There's a few other components that would be painted black. Uh, we'll get to that at some point, go back through. Uh, what happened was when we had this tank contracted for repaint on the outside, we also had it contracted for a B blasting here on the interior in the crew compartment. And then it got this white coat, uh, which again, while it's not 100% correct, uh, because all the equipment, like I said, there's different coats that would be repainted. The nice thing it did was it's preserved this vehicle uh, because it's south side, well, it's south side for 75 years of its life. Uh, but just since it got repainted, it's been about three years because I think it just got repainted right when I came on board as Courier. Uh, so it's actually done a great job of protecting inside the vehicle from the elements, uh, which will allow us then to go back and accurize the vehicle. So not only will we paint a few components, correct colors, get some of the cables uh, reattached to the roof like they're supposed to be, we'll then go through and add stenciling to a lot of these stowage boxes to the controls uh, and other places and eventually, hopefully, get this vehicle uh, close to looking like it did in the 45, 46, 47 period when it was being tested and evaluated by the US Army. Uh, of course, you can see the uh, firewall to the engine compartment's open right now. The panel's actually back in the engine compartment. Uh, the engine and transmission are actually out of the vehicle. They were pulled out in 1976 when the vehicle uh, was rediscovered at Fort Belvoir, Virginia and sent to Fort Knox. Uh, it is over in a restoration shop. At some point in the future, we'd like to get that all cleaned up, fixed up, and reunited with the vehicle. Don't expect this vehicle running anytime soon. Uh, much like the German heavy tanks of World War II, while the Ford V8 engine it had was a good engine in its own right, grossly underpowered for its use. And unfortunately what that meant for the other T-28 is that while conducting uh, testing evaluation out at Yuma Proving Grounds, uh, it had an engine fire, complete, complete uh, destruction of the entire engine compartment. Eventually that was on that vehicle being scrapped. So in order to preserve and conserve this vehicle, so that generations to come can, can enjoy it and see it. We have right now no plans to make it run because we want to keep the original components as original as possible. It's actually in pretty good shape. So that's something that me as a museum professional, I really want to uh, maintain this vehicle as close as we can to its original condition with some conservation measures like the new paint added in uh, to dress it out. So that, that's always a delicate balance of how much do you do and how much do you leave original. So getting on to the actual vehicle itself. So this vehicle at 90 tons, with a 105mm T5 E1 gun, had four crew members on board. You had your tank commander, your driver, your gunner, and your loader. Right now, where I'm sitting is approximately the tank commander's position. You can actually see commander's hatches above my head. Uh, tank commander's job would be to be in charge of the entire crew. Uh, at the end of the day, it's the tank commander's responsibility for whatever the crew has done or what the crew hasn't done, which is not always a good thing. Uh, as tank commander, you're the eyes and ears of the vehicle, especially in this one, because there's really not a lot of places where everyone else can look at. The driver actually has the next best visibility, but the commander would be expected to have his head out of the hatch looking for targets, looking for natural threats, meaning bridges, ditches, anything else the tank needs to navigate over. Uh, and he would be making the calls to the rest of the crew. So as a tank commander, again, out of the hatch, you'd be trying to stay at what we call an aim tape deflate, so no higher than here on the chest, because any higher, if for some reason the tank begins to roll over going down an embankment, he has to be able to fall back in pretty quick uh, to protect himself. Uh, so tank commanding, very stressful job, but it's very fun because you are literally the captain of, of a land battleship. 
Uh, so there's a lot of responsibility, but a lot, of, a lot of fun memories for me being a tank commander myself in the past. Um, so just looking at tank commander, he's pretty much shoved here in the corner. Uh, but here I have an excellent view of what the entire crew is doing. It's if I need to manage the crew, uh, loader who would be right here in the middle of the vehicle, he actually essentially has most, he, the loader has the most space in this vehicle because he can move back and forth and he has to because there's ammunition racks on every side of this vehicle in every crew section. Uh, so, you know, if commander has to tell the loader something, he can easily reach out and touch him. I can easily move forward to the gunner. Driver's a little out of hand, but he can still see me. So if for some reason we lose radio comms, the driver just has to turn his head and I could communicate with hand signals to the driver if need be. Uh, so overall, not a bad uh, crew commander's position, especially because the entire crew is in this compartment. On a conventional tank with a turret, you would have the driver in the hall, the rest of the crew in the turret, uh, and so that would create some communication problems. Not an issue in this vehicle as well. So here I am, I'm up in the T-28 gunner's position. Uh, arguably after the tank commander, the most important position because that's the whole point of this vehicle is this massive gun right here. Uh, this is the T-5 E1 105mm main gun. Uh, of course designed to not only engage bunkers, built up machine gun nests. It could also be engaged against tanks. There actually was armor piercing rounds for this vehicle and for its T5E1 gun. Uh, has an effective range of 2,000 yards in the manual. And I will tell you, this gun can shoot farther than that. Uh, that range is limited by the ammo and visibility from this vehicle. So when, when that's written on paper, that's just the effect of using all the components on a tank with the speedbo engaged. Uh, this could obviously shoot much farther. Uh, speaking of engaging with its optics, so the gunner up here has two primary optics. Uh, first, he would have a telescope sight that's actually mounted with the gun. It actually goes up through the front armored mantlet. So you would actually be able to see up through here. Uh, you would have a sight that would probably sit right about here. Gunner could lean in, look through it. It would be graduated to the different ranges for the different ammunition types. The gunner would then also have a backup sight up here in a periscope mount. Uh, that would also have a sight in as well uh, for backup emergencies or for ranging. So this wouldn't be quite as zoomed in as this telescopic sight. Operating the gun. Uh, first over here is where you'll notice there's a big hole. This is where the elevation control would go. Uh, when we got in the tank uh, last week to prep for the move, I was really sad because that was gone. Uh, thankfully, after we crawled back through the engine compartment though, we found it, so we got to get this cleaned up and we can once again have the elevation on, but it's just a simple crank system. And that allows the, uh, the gun to elevate, let's see, the manual says 19.3 degrees up, 5 degrees depression. And then over here, behind me just a little bit, this is the traversing gear. And that allowed the gun to traverse left and right 10 degrees off center line of the tank. So. You're not tied directly to the center line of the vehicle. This still has some traversing capability for the gunner. But anything beyond that 10 degrees, the gunner would have to communicate with both the tank commander and the driver to guide him on, uh, on point, much like other uh, fixed uh, gun vehicles. You would have a lot of succinct commands being given. There wouldn't be a lot of uh, off script, if you will, comments because everyone's just trying to get the pertinent information to each other. Uh, then, you can barely, well, I don't know if you can see here, but then down below me, there's actually a foot uh, pedal that then the uh, gunner would use to actually fire the cannon. So once he gets on target, he doesn't even have to move his hands, just stomp down, uh, the gun fires. Now talk about the gun fire, of course, what do you feed the gun? Well, you have 62 main gun rounds on board. It's two piece ammunition. So you have powder charges uh, in, in the brass uh, cartridge casings, and then you have the actual shell, the actual round that will go down the, uh, the gun barrel and hopefully hit targets. So pretty much the, half this vehicle's interior is just for the ammunition. So if we had all the ammunition here, it would look a lot more cramped, a lot darker. Uh, but one thing that's really cool is that you, know, you have racks behind me here, right here at the gunner's position, you have racks over here on all the sides, and then you have other racks down here as well. So, you know, probably the loader's probably gonna be using, there's one rack over there where it's standing up That'd be really easy to get to. He would then probably switch to these wall racks. Uh, up here with the gunner, probably not easy to get to, so probably not right away. But then you also have these bins on the side, uh, which open up and actually have spring-loaded uh, racks for the ammunition. I'm actually really happy 
uh, the shape these are in. They show a little bit of corrosion from being outside all these years, but overall they're really good shape. So 62 rounds of ammunition for a vehicle this size, that's actually pretty good. If you compare it to uh, the IS-3 with 122 millimeter gun, only had about 18 main gun rounds on board. So th this has enough ammunition to stay in a fight for a good long while. So I've talked a little bit about engaging, uh, well, direct fire engagement of targets, so actually using the gun, using the gunner's main sights to engage a target he can see. But this tank, like all American takes the time, and actually even to today, we still keep uh, the, the techniques in our manuals. This tank would have been capable of indirect fire, like an artillery piece. So right here, up here, you'll see there's a little, little container. That would have been a gunner's quadrant. Uh, it'd be an angled quadrant that would actually, if I pulled it out of its protective sleeve here, mount it on top of the gun. And if I'm receiving uh, fire commands from, say, a uh, forward observer or, or a fire direction officer in the unit uh, who would tell me how many degrees this gun needs to go, uh, watching that gunner's quadrant, the gunner can actually set the gun then to fire like an artillery piece at targets way farther away that you can't even see. So there is a dual purpose to this gun as well. All right, so now I've moved across to the other side of the main gun into the driver's position. So as the driver, uh, of course, I'm maneuvering the vehicle, which is powered by a Ford GAF V8 engine. Uh, of course, the uh, Ford GAF was a uh, modified version of the Ford GAA, which was used in later M4A3 variants of the M4 Sherman tank. Uh, the uh, net, uh, net horsepower on that engine was 500 horsepower, which I would say for a 90 ton tank is definitely underpowered. And it was attached to a torquematic transmission as a solid power pack in the back of the end, uh, in the engine compartment. So you don't have a drive shaft uh, going through the vehicle like you did on the Sherman tank. Everything is in the back of the tank. Uh, again, I mentioned that that was a severely underpowered engine. That's why the other T28, uh, unfortunately, was lost to a severe engine fire, just overtaxed it. Uh, now, I will say in the case of a fire, if I'm here at a hatch, I'm very lucky because I can just go right at the hatch. But also at the bottom of the vehicle, there are two, and one on either side, there are two escape hatches that with the simple movement of a latch, they're pretty heavy, they'll fall out on their own. But I will say, if you are in very uh, soft ground where the tank has sunk in a little bit uh, because the tracks have dug in a little bit, you're gonna be disappointed when you drop those because they may only fall two or three inches. And that actually was a complaint uh, because very similar hatch design on the uh, T26 E3 Pershings that went over initially. Uh, crews would try to escape and find the hatch only fall like two or three inches in muddy ground. So that caused some issues. So talking about the driver's position, so I have an all-around vision cupola. So this is actually of all the World War II era vehicles, probably the best visibility for driver because he can actually see 360 degrees from his position. Uh, the seats or the remnants of the seat, this is actually the seat mount, so I'm missing the cushion in the back. Uh, it's adjustable. So right now it's up in the topmost position. So for me, you'll notice I'm crouching out right now. So if I'm driving uh, behind our own lines, we're moving towards the front lines, I can have my head out of the hatch as the driver and adjust the seat so it's fully way up. I don't have to adjust any of the controls or anything. They're long enough to, to operate from both a lower and a higher position. And then once we get to the front line, uh, simply operate my lever here on the side, seat collapses down, I can close my hatch, and now I'm looking through the vision blocks uh, in the cupola. So pretty good vision for a driver. Uh, and now I will show you the controls of driving the T28. All right, so now let's talk about how the driver would operate the controls of the T28 super heavy tank. So starting over here from left, going on to right, uh, there are several controls that are actually fairly unique to this vehicle. So over here, you have your uh, speed range selection is what it says in the manual. So pretty much your gear shifter. A uh, little different since this is equipped with a torquematic uh, transmission. So you have three forward gears, and then you have one reverse gear, and that's it. Uh, because of the way of the tank, you're not going to have a lot of gears. Over here is the hand throttle, so that, that's your gas. Uh, the manual does make mention that there was supposed to be a foot throttle as well. However, it's not in this vehicle, so either at some point it went away, or they made a modification where you only use the hand throttles. That I have to do some more research on. Here in the center, of course, are the primary controls. These are your steering levers. So if I wanted to go left, I pull back on the left side, push on the right, and that will uh, brake on this side of the tracks as well as you know, throttle forward on the right side of the tracks. So that's how I steer, uh, much like a skid steer today. And then down here, I have my brake pedals. 
So that is how I'd also break my track. And at 90 tons, uh, I would say don't expect the tank to stop quick, but it's only going at a top speed of eight miles per hour. So that's not really a huge issue. And then finally, uh, up here I have two primary gauges. Uh, I have my tachometer, and then I have my speed gauge, which I have to say if a top speed of eight miles per hour is very optimistic showing, uh, I think it goes up to 60 miles per hour. Yes, it goes up to 60. Uh, and it actually shows a top, huh, just making sure here. So it shows a top uh, mileage on the vehicle. Uh, it's either, uh, thinking it's pretty much at 68 miles that was driven on this vehicle. Either that or it's 680 some, but I'm pretty sure that's just 68 miles and some change that was ever driven on this vehicle. I did not expect, I, I doubt it went uh, very far during its lifetime. Now I would over here have the driver's primary control panel, which would have everything I would need to start up and other gauges as well. Unfortunately, that's been long gone. That probably was taken out of the vehicle decades ago. And that is the basic layout of the driver's station, the T28. Hey guys. Thank you so much for watching this video. This is an awesome tank, one of a kind. I'm super thankful to Mr. Kogan and to the facility here for allowing me to come and film and show you guys what it's all about. Well, I'm just very glad we can do it. Uh, this vehicle, like I said, for just its, its sheer size and mass has captured a lot of imagination. So I'm really glad we can share the interior. Like I said, it's never been done before with video, except for a few bits and pieces of maintenance in the past. It has never had a home inside. And so the fact that for the first time in 75 years, this vehicle is going to actually rest inside a climate controlled building uh, is going to do massive amounts of help in preserving it for the future so that other people can learn from it, can enjoy it in the future. Uh, once we get it inside, which will be its own monumentous uh, task, uh, next after that, we're gonna be moving in our T29E3. We do have a T29 heavy tank. It's gonna be going into the uh, restoration shop that's under uh, renovations now. Uh, but T2093 will be beside the T28, and then we'll have our T30 and T34 US heavy tanks. So we're gonna have quite a matchup, I think, of US heavy tank prototypes. And those are just but a small piece of the amount of vehicles we're gonna have inside this building. Uh, we're looking at over 200 pieces of military historic armor related equipment. So I'm just really excited about it. And I hope we're able to continue sharing that all with you. So thank you so much for having us. It's absolutely my pleasure to come out here and film with Mr. Kogan in this incredible historic collection and help him share what he knows. Make sure to follow this channel for some more tank videos and other stuff from military history and awesome places like this. But don't forget to follow the NACC on their social media channels because Rob does an amazing job sharing oh, part you. of the process and the history. And you guys can keep up with that on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And the links are down below in the description of the video. So don't forget to follow those and I'll see you back next time for another super cool tank and some more of the moving process out at this legendary facility. Thank you.